Rosh Hashanah means the head or the beginning of the year. And it starts a series of fall festivals that God has proclaimed for Israel. I have found these fall festivals to be prophetic and have been really amazed at the prophecy that is in them that tells us about end times. So I'd like to start with Rosh Hashanah and the following 10 days of awe. The Jewish tradition is that God will judge just a few of the, of the Jews on Rosh Hashanah, those that he finds to be righteous. Christian tradition sees the rapture of all believers in Christ, but I disagree. I find that God will be selecting a remnant that he deems righteous. Now, we can't be perfect, so it's righteous in God's eyes, those who are righteous in God's eyes, out of Israel and out of Gentile believers in Christ. It has nothing to do with belief in Yeshua. It has to do with God's concept of righteousness. And so my conclusion is more in line <laughs> with the Jewish thinking. Let's look at scriptures and, and see what, what scripture tells us. First, let's look at the, the Christian tradition of Rosh Hashanah. The Christian tradition is that all believers in Christ, Jew and Gentile, will be raptured to, to go up to God. And that is the prophetic symbolism of Rosh Hashanah. They find that only Jews who believe in uh, Yeshua, or perhaps in the coming of the Messiah, will be included. I disagree. I think that uh, certainly all Jews will see the Messiah at some time, but God's decision of the uh, remnant really is based on righteousness, not on belief in Yeshua. So the tradition is that all believers in Christ, Jew and Gentile, will be raptured. And that Jesus is... Re now here, here's another interpretation. <laughs> this is another one. <clears throat> the other one is that Jesus is returning for a pure and spotless bride. So that he will only... the only ones being raptured, which equals being saved in, in Christian terminology, are those who are pure and spotless, that means righteous. So that particular interpretation finds that only the righteous believers in Christ will be saved. I, of course, disagree with that. I find that the role of the remnant is in God's plan to help bring all of God's people into his presence. Now, <clears throat> let's take a look. There are three names for Rosh Hashanah, descriptive names. One is Yom HaZikron, which means the Day of Remembrance. Now, um, this term is in the Talmud, and it is apparently originated after the destruction of the temple. So they had to think of, the Jewish sages had to think of something uh, that would be important. So the first thing is Yom uh, HaZikron actually means um, a reminder by blowing. That's what it means. A reminder by blowing, the, the day of, of, of remembering, the day of remembering. And it's a reminder by blowing, the trumpet blows. Now, the, the sages came up with remembering God's creation of the world. <clears throat> now, that's not in alignment with, with my thinking and with Christian thinking. Let me show you my suggestion. My suggestion is that the end of time will restore God's creation to the beginning. Now, Rosh Hashanah is not the end of time. Rosh Hashanah is a righteous remnant will initiate this restoration. All right. Now, there are three names for Rosh Hashanah. Yom HaZikron, the Day of Remembrance, is one. Um, here's uh, Yom HaTeruah, that's the Day of Blowing, and the trumpets will be blown on that day. Now, this is really interesting. After the Jews escaped from Egypt, at the time of the Exodus, Exodus they were in the wilderness, they were at the foot of Mount Sinai, and they were camped in... Um, in, in four directions, north, south, east, and west, and in the middle was the tabernacle. Now, what we learn is that when only one trumpet is blown, leaders, heads of the divisions of Israel, 
respond to one trumpet. It also says that the camps pitched on the east side will respond when one trumpet is blown. That's really significant because the leaders are the Roshim, which is a word that identifies the remnant. They're the heads of the tribe. They're the, the leaders of the tribe. They're the ones that um, are, are leading by their righteous walk, all right, which is the remnant, leading by their righteous walk. Now the east side is significant because the sun rises from the east and the, the Jews thought that that's, God was, is, was in the east because the sun rose from the east. And in fact, if you go to Israel today, you'll see that on the east side of the walls of um, uh, 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 where the temple is located on, on, the, uh, on the east side, the, the, the um, entrance, the gates, the golden gates are closed because it's believed <clears throat> that when God returns, he's, he's coming from the east and will enter into the east gates to go up into, into the new t temple in the millennial kingdom to have a, a presence in the new temple temple. So I find that one trumpet blowing is really significant. It's the leaders who the Roshim uh, identified as the remnant and the camps on the east side which is where uh, God comes from. Now when two trumpets are blown all the congregation responds and also it tells us the camps pitched on the south side which I'm not I haven't figured out what the symbolism of that is yet. But two trumpets is all the congregation. So first God is calling a remnant and then the remnant has a role to play. And after the role that they play, God will, there will be the two trumpets and all the congregation, all God's people will come into his presence. There is a third name for Rosh Hashanah and that's Yom Hadin. That means the day of judgment. And there will be a judgment according to tradition, both Christian and Jewish, a day of judgment on Rosh Hashanah. Now the Talmud, which is a collection of writings, um, collected the work of the sages going back really several hundred years and collecting them in the Talmud and then adding new work as well. Um, the, the Talmud claims that the righteous, God will select the righteous and they will be entered into the book of life. Now, um, the English translation for the next group is evil. Um, I really am very, um, uh, I'm al almost angry at the term evil. It's being bantered around right now. In the Bible, the English translation evil simply means those who are not righteous. That can include uh, believers in Christ. It can include some Jews. It could include people who don't believe in, in Yeshua. It just means the unrighteous. And so there, there, there are two categories. There's the righteous and the unrighteous. So the righteous, um, according to the Talmud, will be written in the Book of Life and will come into God's presence because they are righteous and capable of coming into God's presence without dying. Now the unrighteous are, are are written into the book of death, but there's a third category. The third category is almost everyone else. Those in between who are not righteous and they're not unrighteous. Now think of yourself. Are you 100% righteous? No. Um, do you have some righteousness in you? Yes, of course you do. Of course you do. But there are unrighteous parts in you also. You know, I mean, we're, we're not per perfect. <laughs> we're not 100% perfect. So um, most are in between. Um, they have some righteousness in them, but they have still some sinning aspects in them. And their judgment will be suspended until Yom Kippur. Now that's the Jewish tradition. That's not what I am concluding. That is the Jewish tradition. All right, let's go on. I'd like to take a look at some prophetic passages that refer to Rosh Hashanah. And we read, he brought forth his people with joy, his chosen ones with a joyful shout. Now chosen ones is that, that um, term th that means God is selecting a few out of a large number. And it's referring to the remnant. The shout is the trumpet. And I suggest that one trumpet will be blown. All right. And then it continues. He gave to the remnant, the chosen ones, the lands of the nations that they might take possession of the people's labor. Now in Ezekiel it it defines the 
the boundaries of what Christians call the Millennial Kingdom. Jews don't call that. They, they know there will be a period of, of peace, a future period of peace, and they know that it will be an enlarged Israel of what, what is Israel today. And you can see in the map that each of the 12 tribes is given an allocation of, of land. The one in, in orange is the holy portion where the, the temple, the third temple, will be constructed there. And, the, and Yeshua will be the, um, the king and the high priest, both king and high priest. And my suggestion is that the remnant will come in with Yeshua to the millennial kingdom, but it's only a thousand years. Um, by the way, it's the remnant and their families will come in to the Millennial Kingdom. It's only a thousand years and there will be things happening after that. <laughs> okay, and then it continues, so they, the chosen ones who have responded to one trumpet, might keep his statutes and observe his laws, laws praise the Lord, and that identifies the remnant, those who are keeping his statutes and observing his laws. That's righteousness. They're walking in righteousness. And let's see, I had another, oh, I found another passage interesting in the book of Revelation. Um, and I, I suggest that this is Rosh Hashanah. The angel said to me, why do you wonder? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast which carries her, which has seven heads and the ten horns. Now those are, are kings and kingdoms. Um, and then it continues. These will wage war uh, against the Lamb. So this is Satan and his army is going to wage war against the Lamb. The Lamb, of course, is Yeshua. And the Lamb will overcome them because he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And those with him are the called and chosen, there's our word chosen, and faithful. Now the called are all those who belong to God, but the chosen makes that a much smaller number because they're the ones that God is selecting to carry on the next part of his plan to redeem all of his people. They're called the remnant and they are the faithful ones. Okay? Now, Rosh Hashanah. Let's just summarize here. A tr one trumpet will blow. The called and chosen and faithful will be resurrected to join Yeshua. Not all believers in Christ. Satan and his army, after there will be a battle, and at the end of the battle, Satan and his army will be defeated. Satan will be chained for a thousand years, and that's what Christians call the Millennial Kingdom. He will be chained for a thousand years, which is why there will be a reign of peace for a thousand years, because Satan will not be there to, to prompt sin. Um, you know, we're still prone to sin, even without Satan, so we have to learn how to overcome sin in our lives. The remnant and their families will enter the Millennial Kingdom. Uh, and this is, this is my, my interpretation. I'm sharing with you what I have found. <clears throat> now, I want to go on. The Ten Days of Awe follow Rosh Hashanah. And I was fascinated by this because how long does the Great Tribulation last? It lasts for seven years. Well, the ten days of awe is the number ten. The number seven and the number ten cannot be equated. They, they, they're not the same. They're very different numbers. So, the Great Tribulation is seven. The ten days of awe is ten. Let's talk about the Great Tribulation. The Bible does not give a time for this coming Great Tribulation. Christians have determined it will be seven years, from, and they've taken that from the last week of Daniel's 70 weeks. And, and, and other, so the last week is seven, the number seven, all right? Other tribulations have lasted three and a half years. For example, famine in the time of Elijah lasted three and a half years. So a few Christian theologians have suggested that it's three and a half years, but most Christian theologians have concluded that this, what we call the Great Tribulation, will last seven years. And, and, and that's not clearly defined in Scripture. They have derived that from the book of Daniel. Now, the number 10 is never suggested for the Great Tribulation. So, the number 10... Um, 
If the Great Tribulation lasts seven years, which is by far the majority of thinking among Christian theologians, it cannot be symbolic of the ten days of awe. The ten days of awe are going to have to be symbolic of something else. Now, we look at the number ten. If you multiply ten times ten times ten, you get a thousand. And in and, and Hebraic thinking, that's, that's just done for emphasis. And a thousand millennial, Christians call it the millennial kingdom. Now let's go into Isaiah and we read a description of the millennial kingdom. The wolf will dwell with the lamb and the leopard will lie down with the young goat and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together. That's the time of peace. <laughs> you know, when the lion's not going to be eating people. <laughs> the wolf's not going to be going after the lamb. It's a time of peace. And then it ends, a little boy will lead them, and that, of course, is referring to Yeshua. So this is, is I am suggesting that the ten days of awe are symbolic of the coming millennial kingdom. What happens after the millennial kingdom? Well, <clears throat> we get Yom Kippur and Sukkot, and those are both prophetic. So um, my suggestion is that a Yom Kippur is, is prophetic of a lot that is going to happen, and that Sukkot then is prophetic of a lot that is going to happen. Um, th th that will have to come <laughs> in, in my next two little uh, uh, discussions. So I'm going to leave you now with Rosh Hashanah and a lot to think about about the prophetic symbolism of Rosh Hashanah. Shalom.